left last night. Uh, if you guys will turn with me to page 148 in your book. And the last couple of things we were talking about last night, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the duties that the agent owes the principal. And what we had just started talking about last night were the duties that the principal owes the agent. So as we get further into our discussion of our agency agreements, uh, we're learning that our agency agreements are a two-way street. Both parties have duties and obligations to each other. So we said on page 148 that the duties that the principal owes the agent, well, they owe me the duty to act in good faith. If they hire me to do a job, they can't hinder my efforts. Uh, I think the example we gave was your sever seller never allowing showings. Um, it's awfully hard for me to sell your house if you don't let a buyer in the front door. What about the other side of that? The buyer hires you to help them buy a house, but they're never available to see anything. You guys with me? So we got to kind of like work together here. And then we talked about that the principal owes the agent compensation. Uh, we're going to talk about your money next week, talk about commission, but that's, the, that's what this is all about. They're using an agency agreement to hire me. When you hire me to do a job, I expect to get paid. Pretty simple, right? Seemed fair enough. So that principal, when I've done the job that they hired me to do, I'm owed commission. And then the last thing we said last night was the duties that the principal owes to third parties. So when we're referring to the third parties in this sense, we're pretty much referring to the other person in the transaction. So the third party to the seller is the buyer. The third party to the buyer is the seller, right? They're the other party in the transaction. And bottom line, nobody's allowed to lie. There's never a reason to lie. So the seller can't misrepresent uh, any information. So where we are now is still on page 148. And the question is, what if the principal breaches any of their duties? If the principal breaches any of their duties, if they don't do any of the duties they said that they would, they can be sued. They can be fined. Uh, the buyer, for example, if the buyer finds out after closing that the seller lied, gave them false information about the property, for example, they may be able to take them to court. Um, when your buyer, if your buyer calls you after closing and says, the seller lied, what do I do? The only thing we can tell them to do at this point, you guys, is have them contact an attorney and see what kind of case they have. The other Thing, the other consequence that the, that the uh, principal might suffer in the event of breach, they could be held responsible for my misconduct. So if they tell me some information that I couldn't verify for myself, if they tell me some false information that I couldn't verify, my little red flag go up, did not go up, or I don't have any reason to question them, if it's found out after the work, afterwards, that my misconduct is the actions of the principal, then they may be held liable for my uh, misconduct as well. Let's say for example, it's August and the seller tells me that the heat works. I, I can't turn it on. I have no reason to check it, no reason to verify it. I can only rely on their, what they tell me, right? So the buyer buys, the first cold snap rolls around and the heat doesn't work they may be held responsible for my actions. Again, attorneys are getting involved at this, at this point. The last thing we're gonna say here on 148 is talking about something called the Unfair Deceptive Trade Practices Act. We could be held under this act, um, the sellers could as well. And again, I mean, this is a good way to say, don't lie. The act prevents brokers and owners, uh, false advertising, acting unfairly, deceptively. Again, it's all gotta be hashed out on the court of law. When it comes to this act, 
damages could be awarded to the to the injured party treble damages does anybody know what treble damages are yep you take the amount of the damages times three so the injured party could be awarded treble damages Question. I was so close last night. I hate we couldn't get through these last few slides, but that's all right. We busted through them real quick tonight. <laughs> Questions on this? All right. We're getting ready to talk about classification of agency relationships at the top of page 149. And I want you guys to highlight this, bookmark it, star it, draw a big circle around it, make yourself a note to make flashcards. Classifications of agency relationships tend to be a problem topic. So we're gonna talk through these, make sure we're all good. Before we do that, you guys set your chat to private. I want a private chat just to me, because I want you all to remind me before we get into this conversation, the agency relationship is between the client and who? Private chat, the agency relationship is between the client and who? It happens. <laughs> okay. So the agency relationship is between the client and the firm, not the individual agent. I think it's important that we remember that going into this conversation. So classification of agency relationship, there's three different categories, if you will, that we can classify our agency relationships. The first category, the first classification is the universal agent. The universal agent is giving somebody full power to act on their behalf. You're giving somebody full power of attorney to make all your decisions. The universal agent in an agency relationship in real estate is the purple unicorn. Meaning, how often are we gonna see this? We don't see this often, do we? Think this through, you guys. Would you, in your right, sober mind, give full power of attorney to, for example, Cobble Banker? Let Caldwell Banker make all your medical decisions, make all your financial decisions. Exactly. So the full power, the universal agent, because the relationship is not with the individual agent, it's with the firm. So this is the purple unicorn. I, I really hesitate to use the word never because as soon as I do, there's going to be this one rare exception that happened the 0.01% of the time, but let's just say really, really, really rare. You're not going to give that full power of attorney to the firm. Where you're going to see this universal agent, this full power of attorney, is if, for example, you had full power of attorney over your parents, but that has nothing to do with the firm, does it? That's between the parents and you, your parents and you, not a real estate transaction. The second level, the second classification of agency relationships is the general agent. The general agent has some power. They have power, limited power to make decisions. They have some power to bind. They have some power. How much power? It depends. We got a couple different examples. 
of the general agent. One example of a general agent is the agency relationship between the property manager and the owner of a property. So let's just talk for a second about what we're talking about here. If the owner hires the property manager, the firm, they're hiring the firm, the property manager to manage their property. Let's say you have an investment property and you don't wanna deal with it. You don't wanna deal with tenants and collecting rent and repairs and all this other stuff. So you hire a property manager to deal with it. If that property manager didn't have any power, let's just say they have no power. That property manager is calling you for everything, right? Can I make this repair? Can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do, can I fix this? And at some point you, the owner are gonna go, why the heck am I paying this person if they have to call me for every single thing that I do? So the property manager is a general agency relationship. They have some power. Again, how much power? It is spelled out in our property management agreement. We'll get into property management in unit 12. But let's say, for example, that I have the authority um, through my property management agreement, I have the authority as a general agent to make all repairs up to $500. That means if something breaks, I can just go out and fix it. I don't have to call the owner every single day, every single time I need to change a light bulb, right? If it's up to $500, just take care of it. That's why I'm paying you. If it's $501, now I need to contact you. And that's what we mean by some. The other example that we have of a general agent is the relationship between you and your firm. You are gonna go into your firm as an independent contractor. We're gonna talk about an independent contractor at the end of this unit. Probably, we won't see it tonight. So we'll have that to look forward to next week. Your relationship with your firm is that of an independent contractor and you are a general agent. In other words, you can make some decisions for your firm. You're told when you join your firm what your limitations are, what your the decisions, what, the, uh, what you can and can't do, but you do have some power. For example, we just said the agency agreements are between the client and the firm, yes? As an independent contractor affiliated with the firm, I have the power to sign the agency agreement on behalf of my firm. I have the power to sign the buyer agency agreement on behalf of my firm. And why do I have that power? Because I'm a general agent of the firm. Again, all firms are different. They all have different policies. So how much power and what that power is, they'll help you with, but that's a good example of what we can do. I can sign an employment contract or a, yeah, an agency agreement between the client. I can sign it on behalf of my firm. The third category is the special agent, which has no power. I can't bind, I can't make decisions. I don't have any authority. I do not make decisions on somebody else's behalf. I only speak on their behalf. The special agent, agent is the sales agent. May that be residential sales or commercial sales. So the relationship between the broker and the buyer or seller is that of a special agent. Uh, shake your head, yes or no. Am I allowed to accept or reject an offer on my seller's behalf? No. Why? Because I am just a special agent. I don't have that authority. I don't have that ability. I cannot make these decisions. I can advise. I can, you know, provide information. I'm a fact finder. I can help them get there. I can offer my opinion but I can't make these decisions for them. I cannot find them. 
where am I? Remind me again, who all is going to go into residential sales or commercial sales? It's probably most of us, I feel like, for the most part, most of my classes. Yeah, you guys are special. I mean, we're all special, but you guys are really special, meaning we act on the uh, behalf of our clients, not for our clients. So the universal agent has full power. The general agent has some power. The special agent has no power. So how do you become different type of agent, do you, Mike? It depends on the type of agency agreement that we enter into. So if we're going into a listing agreement or a buyer's agency agreement, that's working with a buyer or seller. So that's my special. If I'm going to be a property manager and I'm going to work with an owner and help them find a tenant and collect rent and make repairs, then I'm going in as a general. So it's kind of like, case by case like you can be a special agent for this client and then a general there you go it depends on what i'm doing for you doesn't it yep other questions on this So universal agent, again, you guys, that's a purple unicorn. Always remember who the relationship was, is with. The firm and either the client or the case in the general, it's the firm and the agent. But it's always with the firm. The individual agent doesn't have these agency relationships. Do you guys mark it, star it, dog ear it, highlight it? You got a little tab to remind yourself to make flashcards on it after class. Good. I call it a problem topic for a reason. Go back and review it. Spend a little bit of time with it. Full, some, or none. Bottom of page 149, we're going to define some more words. Brokerage is the business of bringing buyers and sellers together in a real estate transaction. When we work with buyers or sellers or owners and tenants, we're bringing, we're brokeraging the deal. We're bringing them together. We're bringing them together, the act of bringing them together in this transaction. Broker is who we are, who will soon to be. North Carolina is a broker state. We are all brokers in this state. We have different classifications. We have different levels. We'll talk more about those, but we're all brokers. You may have other states that uh, work different, obviously, but you have, for example, other states where you are a sales associate for a while and then you become a broker. North Carolina, we just skip that sales associate nonsense and we go straight into becoming a broker. We are all brokers. Commission is what we expect to get paid when it closes. So if we're all in, sorry to cut you off. If we're all brokers, that means we can all like open up a brokerage in North Carolina? Eventually, yeah. You can't do it as soon as you get your license. We're not going to hand you a license and let you run amok on the street, right? So there's some other right. thing. But eventually, with after your first couple of years, sure, you can open your own business. We're going to talk about opening your own business. You guys are going to read about it in the comments. Remember that license law and rule comments I showed you guys last night? You're going to read about that in the comments, but we'll talk about if you want to open your own firm. Anybody want to do that one day? Open your own firm? Look at all those hands go up. That's awesome, you guys. Remember your goals. 
Before you open your firm, you got to get your license. How do you get your license? We got to get you through this class. Don't put your cart in front of your horse. So commission is what we get paid when we've done our job. Again, starting to introduce you guys a little bit to commission, talking all about commission next week. Y'all come next week with, with dollar signs in your eyes, all right? Because we're going to talk about your money. It'll be a fun week. The cooperating broker. When you have a real estate transaction that's represented, the seller is represented by a firm and the buyer is represented by a different firm, that different firm is the cooperating broker. That, firm, that agent with that different firm is the cooperating broker. Even though we're two separate firms, we're coming together to cooperate on this transaction. Uh, you guys are going to be members of the multiple listing services. You will affiliate with whatever MLS your firm has joined. Uh, there's, for example, the Triad MLS. We got a uh, Charlotte MLS, Raleigh, Wilmington, Asheville. I don't know how many there are in the state of North Carolina, but they're all over. And when you're cooperating, you're cooperating with other members of your MLS. We're putting our services together in the hopes to bring buyer and seller together. Compare a cooperating broker to an in-house transaction. An in-house transaction, we're all working together in the same firm. Both agents, we're in-house, we're under the same house, we're under the same firm. We should get to that. We mentioned dual agency. We should get to dual agency tonight. Hopefully answer a lot of those questions. So cooperating is another member of your MLS in-house is in the same firm. North Carolina has some requirements to have a license. There are certain activities that are required. There are certain activities that require a license. That's how I should say it. There are certain activities that require a license. Those activities revolve around the transfer of real property. And when we talk about the transfer of real property, what we're looking at here is the activities that are involved in the transfer of real property. And one easy way you guys can remember these activities is if you remember LL beans. List, lease, buy, exchange, auction, negotiate, and sell. If you're involved in these activities of real property for others, for compensation, a license is required. All three activities are required to have a license. If we do away with any of these, a license is not required. Let's say, for example, the for sale by owner. Shake your head, yes or no. Does the for sale by owner need a license? Do they have to have a real estate license? And the answer is no, because they're not doing it for others, are they? They're doing it for themselves. That's what we mean, all three activities. I uh, know, Tessa, I cannot. That's what we mean by all three activities. Restart if you need to, log out, log back in. All three activities are required for a license. What if you think you're gonna do real estate for free? Zero compensation whatsoever. You don't wanna receive anything of value. You don't wanna get commission. You don't wanna get a nice dinner out. You don't wanna get flowers. You don't want to get anything. First off, if you're thinking about that, please call me. Do not do that. Please call me. But if you think that sounds like a good idea and you agree to work for free, no sorts of compensation whatsoever, could you do that without a license? Yeah, there you are. I see you now. Don't do it. But the point here is, you guys, is that all three are required to have a license. 
So we're involved in the transfer of real property, the activities of real property for others, for compensation, and all three activities are required in North Carolina to have a license. Then we start talking about how the different ways that we can create agency relationships. So we've talked about this one pretty good. Um, our agency agreements are the document, it's the employment contract that we use to create the relationship between the firm and the client. Next week, we're gonna start looking at our agency agreements. I'm gonna encourage you to look at them before, you know, over the weekend before next week. We have a listing agreement for example, that creates the relationship between the seller and the firm. Buyer agency agreement creates the relationship between the buyer and the firm. I got a property management agreement. We'll talk about in unit 12. You may have a tenant representation agreement where the tenant is represented by the firm. Our agency agreements are employment contracts that create the relationship between the firm and the client. There could be some other rela agency relationships as well. We talked earlier um, about the relationship between the individual broker and the firm that you're gonna affiliate with. You guys more than likely will be coming in as an independent contractor. We're gonna talk about what it means to be an independent contractor. Again, we probably won't see it tonight. So we'll see it next week. As an independent contractor, who do you work for? Who do you work for? I work for me. I am my boss. Guess what, y'all? If you don't like your boss, <laughs> as an independent contractor, we work for ourselves. I affiliate with a firm. The firm doesn't hire me. I affiliate with the firm. Again, we're going to break down that relationship. But in order to define that relationship between the broker and the firm, then we use an in-house employment contract, uh, maybe called an independent contractor agreement. All firms have one. They're all different. Remember, I always encourage you guys to shop firms before you decide which one to affiliate with. I have a question. So uh -huh. if in North Carolina, we're all brokers, then we don't have to be assigned to a firm, like a brokerage. You do when you're first licensed. I know when you first licensed, but I'm saying like, when you're advanced, like you don't have to. You could go out on your own and start your own. Sure. Uh, we'll talk about it. Yep. But that's only for North Carolina. I don't know about other states. The other relationship between brokers and firm is that cooperation agreement. How are we gonna cooperate? So if I'm the listing firm and you're with the buyer's firm, how am I gonna cooperate with you when you bring me that buyer? How am I gonna compensate you when you bring me that buyer? Um, we're gonna, we talked about the multiple listing services. And one thing that the public doesn't see that members of the MLS see is if I bring you a buyer and this closes, you tell me in the MLS how much you're gonna pay me. I know before I ever see the property, how much I stand to make from this transaction. That's our cooperation agreement that's through our multiple listing services. The other types of the other type of relation agency relationship we can have is something called implied agency. And this is based on the conduct of the parties. There is no agency relationship. Or there is no relation, there is no agreement, there is no document to sign, there is no contract. I just start acting like your agent. 
And that's known as implied agency. And in North Carolina, that's not allowed. All of our agency agreements are express. You guys remember we defined express versus implied. Express says all the terms have been clearly stated. An implied agreement means I just decide to start acting like your agent without having any kind of conversation about it whatsoever. I don't tell you what you owe me. You don't tell me what we owe each other. I just start acting like your agent. That's not allowed in North Carolina. All of our agreements are express. So speaking of those express agreement, that takes us down to talk about the scope of authority. How do I know my scope of authority? An express agreement, the terms have been clearly stated. We know going into this agreement, our duties and responsibilities to each other. Express agreements can be in oral, they can be in writing. In North Carolina, all of our agency agreements must eventually be reduced to writing. We're going to talk, it'll probably be next week, about a time where I have the ability to work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first. But eventually, I got to put it in writing. Express doesn't care if it's in oral or if it's in writing. The thing to know about Express is that the terms have been clearly stated. The terms have been spelled out. What I'm telling you is they've either been spelled out on paper or via conversation. As we said then, then the implied agreement is not Express. We don't have the conversation. We didn't spell out the terms. It's implied based on our actions. Applied agreements are not allowed in North Carolina. The other scope of authority we have is something called a parent authority. Um, this is also frowned upon, this is bad. Um, private chat, everybody please private chat. Remind me in a private chat, which offers do I present to my sellers? Which ones do I present? Are you guys ready for me? <laughs> Y'all are fast typers. Which offers do I present to my sellers? Did I hear from everybody? We have a duty to present all offers. So with this apparent authority, we know I have a duty to present all offers, yes? And the example of an apparent authority, thank you, the example of an apparent authority is when my principal knows my parameters but asks me to go further, asks me to take it a step further. So let's say, for example, my principal, my seller, tells me that they're gonna go out of town this weekend, they're gonna be off the grid. And they say, Julie, if any offer comes in over X amount, go ahead and accept it on my behalf. Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to do that? Absolutely not. Special agent says I have what kind of power? Special agent says I have no power. A parent authority is my principal expecting me to do that. For example, I follow my client's lawful instructions. 
lawful. Written exception. Julie? Yeah. Was the answer to that question a yes or a no? I think I missed it. I forgot the question. What was the question? It was about the um, your client giving you authority to um, know, right? Gotcha. I have special, I'm a special agent, which means what kind of power do I have to bind them? What's my power? Zero. No so they power. may look at me, they may look at me, a parent authority says they may say, I'll give you permission to accept offers for me this weekend while I'm off the grid. Can I? No, they know my limitations. They know what I can do, but they're expecting me to take it a step further. So what do we do in that scenario? I'm not stopping them from going on vacation and going off the grid. Everybody deserves to do that every once in a while, right? Maybe they feel comfortable leaving that decision-making to a family member or a friend. If they don't want to, if they can't, then I need to just take the home off the market for the weekend, right? because I can't have all these offers hanging around while they're off the grid. So the difference in implied, implied is just created by my actions. Apparent, we know the parameters, but the principal is expected me to go beyond those parameters. So the scopes of authorities, <clears throat> talking a little bit about your compensation, page 152, getting into it next week. It's important that we understand that my loyalty is to the one that hires me. And the one that hires me may not be the one to pay me. Where my money comes from has nothing to do with my loyalty. It has nothing to do with old car. Couple examples. The typically the seller pays commission to the listing firm. The listing firm shares their commission with whomever brings the buyer. So let's say you're a buyer's agent with a firm different than the listing firm. The listing firm is ABC Realty. You're a buyer's agent with XYZ. As a buyer's agent with XYZ, isn't the buyer the one that hired you? You have this buyer agency agreement. But the seller is paying the firm. But my loyalty isn't to the seller. They're not to the one that pays me. It's to the one that hires me. When we say the seller typically pays commission, I think a good example of what might be an exception to that rule is the for sale by owner. Fizbo's, as we like to call them. Does the Fizbo have to pay me? Are they under any obligation whatsoever to pay me? No, they're not going it alone. They chose to go it alone. Maybe they're gonna pay you, maybe they're not. Let's say the for sale by owner does pay you. You're the, bring the buyer, you're the buyer's agent and the for sale by owner pays you. You don't owe them anything except honesty and fairness and the disclosure of material facts. That FISBO is a customer, even though they're paying you, your loyalty is to the buyer, the one that hires you. What if the for sale by owner says, no, I'm not gonna pay you. That's the whole reason why I went for sale by owner. So I didn't have to pay commission. I'm not gonna pay you. If the seller's not gonna pay you, who is the other party in that transaction? The buyer. So if the seller's not gonna pay you, the buyer's up. And this is why we have our agency agreements. This is why we require our agency agreements to be in writing. Y'all wanna get paid a commission? This is why we have written agency agreements. If the seller can't or won't pay me, then the buyer's up. We talk about our commission in both seller and buyer agency agreements. Um, 
on page 152, we talk about termination of agency and I didn't feel the need to recreate the wheel. So you guys look with me on page 152. We got some bullet points there. We got some different ways that the agency relationship can terminate. Generally speaking, when our agency relationship is over, when it terminates, then we're done. We don't owe each other duties and responsibilities anymore. So a couple of different ways our agency agreement can terminate. Completion or fulfillment of the purpose. Once I've done the job that you hired me to do, if you hire me to help you sell your house, once that thing sells, I've done my job. I did what you hired me to do. If you hire me to help you buy a house, once that deed gets put in your name, I've done my job. I don't know you anything else. I've done the job that you hired me to do. Our agency agreement will terminate when the transaction closes. All we will learn next week, all of our agency agreements have an expiration date. And when they're over, they're over. We're done. If our agency agreement is today, which is January 19th, that means at 11.59 p.m. tonight, you and I are finished. We don't know each other anything. Could we agree to extend our agency agreement? Sure. But if we don't agree to extend it, when it's done, it's done. Mutual agreements of the parties will terminate an agency relationship. The parties agree to get into an agency relationship together. They can agree to get out of the agency agreement. And remind me, I can see your mouths move. The agency agreement is between the client and who? The firm. Can the individual agent fire the seller? It's not your seller to fire, is it? It's up to the firm if we're gonna mutually agree to terminate the agency relationship. Uh, breach by either parties. Again, we both have duties and responsibilities to each other. So if either party breaches, that may terminate the agency relationship. Operation of law. Let's say you have a home listed for sale and the seller loses the property to bankruptcy. It's no longer the sellers to sell, is it? They're no longer the owner. That's going to end our agency relationship. Destruction or condemnation of the property. If the house you have listed for sale burns down, I no longer have a product to sell. Could I turn around and relist the land if that's what you choose to do? Sure, but that's going to be a different agreement. And then death or incapacity of either party Always please remembering the relationship is between the client and the firm. So if the individual agent passes away, the show goes on. When we talk about death or incapacity of either party, we're saying either the client dies or the firm shuts their doors. The firm has to die. Again, either of those would terminate our agency agreement. Um, let's see, I got a question. If you decide you don't want to take a listing, can the firm tell you you have to take it? They may not, if you don't want it, they may not make you take it, but they might find somebody else. You know what I'm saying? But your firm, if you're to the point where you're not wanting a listing, I bet you your broker in charge is paying attention because if you don't want it, what's up? You know what I'm saying? Um, are we dealing with unreasonable sellers? You know, you tell them, I think I can get you a sales price of 150 and they say, well, let's list it for 345 and see what happens. That's going to be really hard to make that seller happy, isn't it? I mean, maybe last year we could have done it, but not in a normal market. So, you know, if you don't want to take the listing, you know, just get with your firm. We don't have to accept every listing. Yep. So 152, termination of agencies is several different ways that agency can end. <clears throat> I need to go off book for a minute. So everybody pay attention, stop looking at your book. We're gonna go off book for a few slides. Remember you guys, 
we follow the syllabus. If it's in the syllabus, it's a good candidate for your test. So there's stuff in the syllabus that's not in the book and I need to make sure I cover it. So we're gonna go off book. Continuing on with this termination of agency. There's this kind of understanding we just said that our duties typically end when the agency agreement ends, but there are a few exceptions. Um, if you've made any promises or obligations that you haven't fulfilled, you need to fulfill those obligations. Even though agency's over, you made the promise. So any unsatisfied promises or obligations, we need to stick with our word, stay true to our word. If our agency agreement expires while we're under contract, I'm still going to help my client get through closing. So if we're end today, January 19th, and maybe we're scheduled to close next Wednesday, I still owe them that duty to help them get to closing. Now, a best practice is to do an agency agreement extension through next Wednesday right, extend our agreement, but there's no requirement because we still owe that duty. And then after our agency agreement, I can't use any information I learned about my client to benefit myself after the agreement's over. And that's what we're referring to as self-dealing. I sometimes can learn a lot about my sellers, for example, and my buyers, but maybe I learn uh, their motivation. Maybe I learn how low they're willing to go. And if I can't sell their home and our agency agreement expires, I'm not going to use that information against them to benefit myself. The other thing to understand when our agency agreements are over is that generally speaking, our duty of confidentiality is going to continue. In other words, if our agency agreement is over today, this does not give me a golden ticket to run up and down the streets tomorrow shouting out your confidential information. That just doesn't seem nice, does it? So I'm gonna continue to keep your information confidential Unless, let's say for example, you have a listing and you have it on the market for a period of time, you've advertised it for a period of time and it never sells. And that agency agreement expires. That same seller later lists with another firm. You tried, it didn't work out. They're gonna try it again with a different firm. So they've relisted, they have another firm listing their property. And then lo and behold, you pick up a buyer client that's interested in that seller, interested in that property. Why don't you guys tell me in a private chat, who my duty, who is my loyalty to today? And you can tell me B or S, buyer or seller, buyer or seller, not BS, but B or S. Who is my loyalty to today? Today, my loyalty is to my buyer client. Yesterday, it was the seller. Our agency agreement is over. Now I'm representing the buyer, bringing them to the transaction. My duty and loyalty is always to the current client. Again, if you're never sure who you represent, look up who is the firm representing? Who does the firm currently have an agency agreement? So let's say you're that seller. I had it listed, I couldn't sell it. You listed it with somebody else and you get an offer in and you see my name on that offer. You as the seller think, oh, they know everything about me. I think it's really important that we understand that the sellers aren't required to accept any offers. 
the sellers don't have to accept anything. So if that, they're that uncomfortable about working with me, what the world do I know about you? But if you're that uncomfortable working with me, the seller doesn't have to accept the offer of my buyer client. Does this make sense? Because they know what I know about them. So the question comes in, does that mean the stuff I knew about the seller, I can tell the buyer? No, no. That means the stuff that I know about the seller, I owe it to my buyer. I have a duty to my buyer because right now the buyer's getting old car. And remember that C and old car is confidentiality. I tell my client everything about my customer. I tell my customer nothing about my client. So if it's my buyer client today, the seller's my customer who's getting old car. This kind of bumps on our moral compass a little bit, doesn't it? But we always got to ask ourselves, who does the firm represent? What duties does the firm owe the current client? Who are we currently in a relationship with? What are the questions we have about that? So I was just wondering, um, as a realtor, I'm meeting a lot of people. So now I have a house for sale, but then I also, my own person, my own, uh, I'm representing a buyer that actually wants to look at a house that I'm selling. Mm -hmm. So then what is that? That's called dual agency. And I'm getting there. Okay. We're, we're pages away from dual agency. Uh, what if the firm represents both parties? We are pages away from dual agency. Please bear with me. Things change in dual agency. Private chat set to me. I got a question for you guys. Tell me in a private chat, A, B, C, or D. Anybody in? Fiduciary obligations of the agent are owed to the one that hires me. When you hire me, you become my client. When you become my client, you get old car. We have that fiduciary relationship, that relationship of trust. It's not to the one that pays me. It's not to everybody. Just because you call me doesn't mean we're going to enter into, doesn't mean you're going to hire me. It's the one that hires me. Questions? Okay. Break time. Let's take a break. We're going to start talking about agency relationships when we come back.
Tom, yes. We back. On the YouTube channel link or the YouTube link. Everybody see that? I put it in the chat. The link there. Everybody see that? If you need it, click on it, save it, bookmark it, subscribe to it. I think that's a good way to keep it. I had that request come in. So we'll make sure you guys see that. Cool. Does it help to go back through and hear it again and again and again? Guys, remember what we said? Maybe I didn't tell you guys yet. This is my parting speech for the night. So I'll go ahead and share it with you now while we're on it. You guys are not leaving this week as agency experts. There's a whole lot of information. I still got more to go tonight. You guys need to revisit it over and over and over again. So after we leave class this week, your study time this weekend, you need to go back and watch the YouTube channels. Go back through your book. Hopefully we've already looked through unit seven once. So now we can go back and review it again. You can't just, agency is not a one and done. You're not gonna be able to hear it and know you're good and move on. You've got to keep revisiting it so it'll click. Does that make sense? It's, it's tough, and guys, we're not introducing you to all of agency. We're just telling you enough that you need to know to pass your test. You come into post licensing, we got more agency. You affiliated with your firm, we got even more agency. Agency training is ongoing. So please review it, watch the YouTube channel, get the links in the chat, read the book, the online learning system. There's so many resources out there for you guys. There you go, your YouTube playlist. There you go. All right, so I'm just now taking attendance. So let's see what we got. Everybody say cheese. Oh yeah, and you gotta have fun, time fun to have somewhere in, fun somewhere in there too. It's a lot. I'm telling y'all, if anybody ever told you real estate school was easy, <laughs> they lied to you. I don't know another way to put that. You were lied to. You guys, I hope you're committing. I hope you're putting the time in. We only go forward from here. Remember I told you guys on day one, there's no rear view mirror in this class. Have I proven that to you? <laughs> I have taken attendance. So please, if you're just now coming back, tell me that you're... Julie? Yeah. How long do we have um, access to the YouTube videos for? Do you know? I, I leave them up for like a year, year and a half. Yeah, I leave okay, them up gotcha. for a while. Yep, yep. Thank you. So, but I like to keep them forever because this information changes, you know? So um, you'll have, I mean, this will be available. And if you're um, wanting it after, if you're wanting it after I take it down two years from now or whatever, just reach out to me. I'm happy to send you the current. I'm always happy to send you the current class's YouTube channel. Oh, so if you're a couple Thank months you. from now and you haven't gone to your state exam yet, just reach out to me. Guys, Lane and I are here to support you guys, not just through the class, but we're here to support you to get through the state exam. So even after you leave us, when you pass our class and you leave us, we're still here as a resource for you guys. We want you guys to be successful. We want you to do well. So let us know how we can help you. Okay. All right. Starting on page 152, we're going to start talking about different agency relationships. But before we get back in the book, we need to stay off book just for a few more slides. So before we get back into the book and we talk about these agency relationships, we need to consider that there's a several different ways in which the broker can offer agency relationships. So everybody good. I'm still off book. But there's a couple different ways that the broker has available to them. The broker could act as a sole practitioner. It, they're not a firm. They're not set up as a firm. They're out there as a sole practitioner. Show me how many people work for a sole practitioner. 
How many is soul? Soul is just one. So if you're a soul practitioner, you're just a one man show. You don't have a firm. We're going to talk about soul practitioner versus firm. Some of you may be interested in doing this. There are some caveats to being a soul practitioner. We're getting there in license law and commission rule. You guys will read about it in the comments before we talk about it. So if the broker is not a firm, they're a sole practitioner, then the agency relationship is going to be between the broker's company, the sole broker, and the consumer, and the client. Can you send me an email so I remember to do that, Sheena? Shoot me an email or a text. And I'll be happy to do that this weekend, though. Fair enough. I won't do it tonight. I won't get to it tonight, but I'll try to get to it tomorrow. Thank you. This is the least common way, but it can happen. And again, we'll talk about sole practitioners, firms, all that other good stuff. So then the more common way is for the consumer to hire the firm, in which case the agency agreement, the agency relationship is between the consumer and the firm, not the individual agent. Let me know that you're back. I've taken attendance. Let me know real quick that you're back. Thank you. So now we're going to get into these different types of agency relationships. And we're back in our book now on page, starting on page 153. Um, there's a nice little chart for us on 153 that gives us a very, very brief summary. Uh, we're obviously going to break these down, but I think this little chart is a good place to start. And as we get into this discussion, as we get into this conversation, we're going to use pictures. We know by now I'm a fan of pictures. So let me introduce you to some cast of characters. We're going to use some examples of the firm. And in this case, the firm is Julie's Real Estate Shop. We got our buyer. We got our seller. We got agents with Julie's Real Estate Shop. And then we may have different firms. When we're having this conversation of agency relationships, we need to think of Julie's real estate shop as the firm. Let's have this through the scenario, this conversation through the scenario of the firm being Julie's real estate shop. For some reason, as we go through this section and have these conversations, some of you want to get so upset. Why would a firm do that? I don't understand why a firm would do that. I'm not going to do that when I get my license. I need you guys to understand something. You, how you choose to do your business, that's not what you're going to be tested on. Maybe you join a firm that does some of things one way. Maybe you don't. The test is not going to ask you what you're going to do. The test is going to ask you what you can do. So when we're introducing these different agency relationships, y'all, please get out of your way. If you don't like the idea of it, then don't affiliate with that firm. It's kind of simple, right? But don't get in your own way and say, I wouldn't join that firm. You don't have to. But that's not what your test is going to ask you. Do I have everybody? Is everybody good? We got to answer these test questions on what you can do. So we have our cast of characters. We know what's going on and our different agency relationships. And the first type of agency relationship we have is a seller agency only firm. And in these firms, the firm will only always represent the sellers. These firms will never have a buyer client. All the buyers are going to be customers. Another firm can bring us the buyer, but this firm only works with seller clients. The seller is always the client, the buyer is always the customer. So, with our picture, we got the seller, one of you acting as the listing agent, 
you're affiliated with Julie's Real Estate Shop, but we're all hanging out over here together with the seller. The buyer's on the other side. Maybe the buyer's represented by another firm. Maybe they're not represented at all. I don't really care. What I know is that the buyer is not represented by Julie's Real Estate Shop. Julie's Real Estate Shop will only have seller clients. If the firm chooses to set up this way, they will only have seller clients. Then we have firms that may be buyer agency only firms, which means they'll only take on buyer clients. They will never take a listing. They will never work with sellers as a client. In these firms, I don't have my own inventory to show. I can take buyers out and show them other firms listings. I can show them for sale by owners, but the firm will never have listings. Buyers are clients, sellers are customers. You don't see this idea of single agency, seller agency only, buyer agency only, we don't see this much in big areas. Where we see this more common is more rural areas. So if any of you are rural, kind of feel like you live out in the middle of nowhere, you very well may encounter this when you start talking to different firms. So again, our picture, now we're all over here with the buyer, aren't we? Julie's real estate shop, the selling agent, the sellers over there by themselves, again, Maybe they're represented by a different firm. Maybe they're for sale by owner and they're not represented. Doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is Julie's real estate shop is only going to represent the seller. I'm sorry, the buyer. Our buyers are clients, our sellers are customers. <clears throat> You may have agency relationships in firms where we'll work with both. We'll work with sellers, we'll work with buyers, but only one per transaction. Either the seller's my client in this transaction or the buyer's my client in this transaction. Never two clients in the same transaction. Pretty much whichever one comes first is the one that gets to be the client. We work with both of them. Does everybody understand what we mean by the transaction that's getting this property through closing, specifically just speaking about 123 Main Street? So you either represent the seller to sell 123 Main Street or you represent the buyer to buy. One two Main Street, one two three Main Street, but never both in the same transaction. Gives us a little bit more options now, doesn't it? We're not saying no to buyer clients or no to seller clients. We're just saying no to two clients. So our pictures for this, either Julie's real estate shop is all hanging out over there with the seller, representing the seller. Maybe the buyer's represented, maybe they're not. Makes no difference to me. What I know is that the buyer is only is, is represented by Julie's real estate shop. Or Julie's real estate shop is representing the buyer, leaving the seller over there to either be represented by another firm or not represented. An unrepresented seller is known as a for sale by owner. So that would mean that they um, 
so if they got a somebody who wanted to sell their house and then that and then they got a client who wanted to buy a house they wouldn't show that property to the buying client i can't have two clients in the same transaction so pretty much it's, it's the first one to sign the agency agreement right who gets to be my client who signs it first either the seller or the buyer and if this buyer says i i i, I don't Mm -mm. I want to be represented. I don't want to not be represented. Then they got to go somewhere else because I can't represent them because I already represent the seller. So I got to send them to another agency firm down the street. Maybe I can work out a referral fee agreement, right? Because I sent them that buyer, but I can't because I already have a seller as a client. It's one or the other. I'm not, can you, can you clarify that question for me? I'm not, I'm not following it there. Then we have a type of agency relationship called sub-agency. Yeah. Oh, you just muted again. See your mute button. Yep. Y'all know I know on a t-shirt that says you're me? on mute. <laughs> you what? <laughs> you there? Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, sorry about that. My my computer is acting like really weird, but I was asking, can the role of the seller and the buyer, can it interchange per client? Like if I'm at a firm and someone comes in and says, hey, I want to buy a house um, like on a Monday and then you come to work Tuesday and somebody else comes in and says, hey, I don't want to sell house. Can you both of those at the same time? Not in the same transaction. It's one client per transaction. So if the buyer hires me to help them buy this property, I can't represent the seller. If the seller's already hired me, I can't represent the buyer. So I think to answer your question, we can't like toggle back and forth. One client per transaction. The first one to sign the agency agreement with me gets to be the client. To, to clarify, it's hard to hear, but you can have multiple simultaneous transactions. Can have multiple what? Simultaneous transactions. Yeah. One, the transactions referring to the sale and the purchase of one, two, three Main Street. Yes, but one to her point, if you if two people come in, one buyer, one seller, you can service them both as long as they're not in the same transaction. Correct. One client per transaction. So I can help the seller sell one, two, three Main Street. I can help the buyer buy four, five, six Elm Street because they're not in the same transaction. I can't help both with 123 Main Street. That's the same transaction. Does that answer? Does that make sense? Okay. Another agency relationship is sub-agency. Before I flip the slide, I need you guys to understand, sub-agency can take on two different forms. Sub-agency can look two different ways. So the first way that sub-agency can look, we've already talked about this. Sub-agency is referring to an agent of an agent. And what sub-agency is referring to, remember who the relationship is with. The relationship is with the firm. So if you all work, if you are affiliated with Julie's real estate shop and one of you gets a listing, I allow one of you to work with my seller. You get the tag, you get the title of the listing agent. Everybody else by default is a sub-agent. We all owe these duties 
to the seller, even though one of you is actually directly working with the seller. We all owe these duties by default because my relationship is with, the seller's relationship is with the firm, not one individual agent. So what I'm telling you guys with sub-agency, in a sense, when one of you gets an agent or gets a client, when one of you gets a seller, all of us gets a seller. If one of you signs a buyer's agency agreement, all of us have a buyer client. It's your default of being with the company. Now, let me ask you, you guys are sub-agents. One of you is the listing agent. The rest of you are sub-agents. Does the listing agent get to boss you around and tell you what to do and tell you to go make coffee and copies and everything like that? No, they're not your boss. I'm still your boss, right? You're still affiliated with me. So it's not like the listing agent has any kind of power over you. I just allow one of you to work with my seller. The rest of you are hanging out over here under my umbrella. And that's the way one form of sub-agency can work. When one of us gets a listing, we all get the listing. A uh, question comes in, I think what we mean is if my listing agent isn't treating my seller right, if the one of you that I allows to work with my seller and they're not happy or they're not satisfied with you, can I pass that on to one of any other one, other one of you? Absolutely. It's my listing. It's my seller. So if my seller and Tom, I just looked up and saw you, so I'm going to pick on you. If Tom has this listing and the seller calls me and says, I am not happy with Tom. I want to terminate. You think I'm going to let that seller walk away that fast? You think I'm going to be like, okay, sign here. I'm like, I tell you what, I'm sorry things aren't working out with Tom. Let me introduce you to Sheena. Maybe things will work. So now Sheena steps up. Tom steps back to a sub agent. I may get you a referral. Don't worry. I'll try to get you something because you did a little bit of work. But now I'm going to allow Sheena. And me as the BIC because it's my client. So if my client's not happy with you, yeah, I can reassign them to somebody else in the office. At the end of the day, I need a happy client, right? And if you're not doing it, I'll find somebody else that will. Thank you, Tom, for being a good sport. I didn't mean to pick on you, but you were the first one I saw. Tom's going to be a great agent, you guys. Don't let me. <laughs> you know, I aren't getting any listings from Tom. So this is one way that sub-agency can look. It's an in-house. It's internal. And it's by default. One of you gets to be the listing agent. The rest of you are a sub-agent, an agent of an agent. The second way that sub-agency can work. is if any broker, any firm, whether you are with my firm or with a different firm, whenever somebody brings an unrepresented buyer, in this case, the buyer is not represented, which makes them a customer. The agent working with this buyer customer is going to be in as a seller sub-agent. You don't represent the buyer. The buyer's chosen to go unrepresented. We'll talk about why they may not hire you in just a second. But you don't represent the buyer. But yet you're still involved in the transaction because you put the buyer in coach. You got the buyer in your plane, right? And you got them back here and coach, but you got to have a role in the transaction. You got to have a reason to be here. So when you bring this buyer customer, when you bring this unrepresented buyer, you don't come in as the buyer's agent. The buyer's not represented. You come in as the seller sub agent. Here's the deal. Every broker, every firm in your MLS when I woke up this morning, I looked at the Triad MLS and we had about 2,500 active listings, give or take. 
25 active, 100 active listings. All agents within the Triad MLS have one duty, and that's to find all 2,500 of those sellers a ready, willing, and able buyer. That's who I owe my duty to unless you hire. So when I woke up this morning, I owe 2,500 sellers the obligation of finding them a ready, willing, and able buyer. And when we talk about this idea of this ready, willing, and able buyer, I always think of this three-legged stool. What happens if one of those legs get kicked out from underneath us? Doesn't the stool fall over? We know that all three legs to hold it up. Same thing with that idea of the buyer. I need the buyer to be ready, ready, willing, and able. Not all firms not all sellers are willing to offer seller sub-agency. The firm has to have a policy in place about whether or not they're going to offer seller sub-agency. Am I going to offer to compensate somebody to bring a buyer to the transaction that is with a different firm? The firm has to have a policy and the seller has to agree to pay that seller sub-agency, and all that is handled in our listing agreement. We hash that out in the listing agreement. Why a firm may not offer seller sub-agency or a seller may not like to offer seller sub-agency is something called vicarious liability. The listing firm and the seller could be held liable for the seller sub-agent's actions. If they mishandle, if they mistreat the transaction, the seller and the listing firm could be held responsible for that. And because of that, some firms will not offer seller sub-agency. Think about this. If you open that up to all agents in the Triad MLS, you're offering another agent from another firm that you don't know. You don't know how they conduct their business. You don't know what kind of training they've had. You know absolutely nothing about them. You could be setting yourself up to be liable for their misconduct. You could be setting your seller up to be liable for their misconduct. And that's what we mean by this vicarious liability. So let's back up and cover a few things here. First off, I know the burning question in your mind. Why would a buyer not hire me? Why would a buyer choose to go unrepresented? Guys, the truth is most buyers do want representation. Most buyers do want to hire a firm to be represented to help them through this transaction. Some buyers may choose to go unrepresented. I think the best example of the buyer that may choose to go unrepresented is the investor that does this 10, 12 times a year. They know what they're doing. They buy 10 houses a year. They don't need you, but they need somebody to assist them and like, you know, allowing them to see the property, allowing them to get their home inspector in, right? They need somebody to open the front door for them. So while they're not hiring you, you're still working with them. Remember our plane? You got them back there and coach. You can help them get there safely, but you're not representing them. The other piece of this, if you are acting as a seller sub-agent and you have a buyer customer, before you show that property, you need to verify that the firm is willing to cooperate with and work with a seller sub-agent. And how you know that is by looking in your MLS. It'll tell you who can bring the buyer. Is it a buyer agent, a seller sub-agent, or both? And if the MLS says buyer's agent only, they've said no to unrepresented buyers, which means you can't show that buyer that property because they chose 
not to be represented. So seller sub agency, again, we got our listing agent, seller, Julie's real estate shop, that piece hasn't changed. Then I got this person down here acting as a seller sub agent that's working with the unrepresented buyer, but the buyer chose to be unrepresented. The buyer chose to hang out over here by themselves and did not be represented. So in this case, this agent is a member of Julie's real estate shop, working with an unrepresented buyer. Everything that this agent does is in the benefit of our seller, presenting an offer, assisting them through the transaction. I'm just not offering a old car. I'm not putting them in first class. So this person, again, if you're involved in the transaction, you have to have a role. And if the buyer's unrepresented, they've already said, I don't want you as a buyer's agent. So we proceed, seller sub agent with Julie's real estate shop, unrepresented buyer, or seller sub agency can come from a different firm. Again, the buyer chose to be unrepresented. The buyer chose to go through this transaction without the assistance of an agent. But it's in all of our seller's best interest, everybody in the Triad MLS, it's in our seller's best interest to get our seller to closing. Most buyers wanna go represented. Most buyers hire an agent. I think, and this is just my opinion, I think all first time home buyers should hire an agent. They don't know what they're doing. Guess what? If you haven't bought a house in five years, I think you should hire an agent because things have changed since you last bought a house five years ago. But guys, I can't make anybody enter into an agency agreement with me. I can't make anybody be represented. I can't put the pen in their hand and force them to sign. If ultimately they choose to go unrepresented, if allowed by the seller and the firm, my role proceeds as a seller sub agent, which means the buyer's unrepresented, which means the buyer is customer, customer, customer. The buyer is our customer. That's what we mean by un represented. Maybe the seller sub agent is with Julie's real estate shop. Maybe they're not. Maybe we're willing to work with seller sub agency from different firms. Maybe we're not. Again, before you go show that property as a seller sub agency, make sure that Julie's real estate shop is willing to cooperate with you. And if MLS says buyer's agent only, you can't show that property to the buyer. I guess they should have hired you when they had that option, right? Most buyers hire a firm. Most buyers want representation. But in the event you come across one that doesn't, this is where we need to better understand seller sub-agency. All right, what questions do we got about seller sub-agency? Two forms. We're going to look at our listing agreement next week. And we're going to see where the seller authorizes, if they authorize the firm, or if they allow, I should say, if the seller will allow seller sub agency. It's something that we have to agree to in our agency agreement. The firm has to have a policy of, bless you, 
the firm has to have a policy on it. And then the seller has to agree to it. And the, the risk, the danger with this is that vicarious liability. Uh, page 155 in your book talks about vicarious liability about halfway down in the italics. If your seller agrees for seller sub-agency, they need to understand that they, along with Julie's Real Estate Shop, could be responsible for the seller sub-agent's misconduct. Questions? So we've talked about when the firm will represent only one side in the transaction. We've talked about when the firm will only represent one side. Maybe they'll only represent the seller. Maybe they'll only represent the buyer. Maybe it's one per transaction. Maybe we can be involved in a transaction where the buyer's unrepresented. So now let's talk about when the firm represents both buyer and seller in the same transaction. And that's something called dual agency. I have a request. Will you guys please hang on to any questions for the time being while we go through the next few slides? And I promise you I'll leave plenty of time for questions. But it might be that if you give me a few minutes, I might answer your question as you're typing. Is that good? Dual agency is an in-house transaction. In-house transaction means both the buyer and the seller are by the same firm. We're all in the same house, if you will. We're all with the same firm. And the absolute simplest breakdown of dual agency that I've been able to come up with is one firm, one transaction, two clients, and dual agency could be one or two individual brokers. Simplest, simplest breakdown of dual agency I can offer you. One firm, one transaction, two clients. The seller has hired the firm to sell 123 Main Street, the firm has a buyer client interested in buying 123 Main Street. Maybe you have one agent working with both seller and buyer. Maybe you have two, one working with the seller and one working with the buyer. It doesn't matter because the relationship are between the clients and the firm. Dual agency does not just happen by accident. Dual agency is intentionally created with informed written consent of both parties. Let's talk about what that means. It is intentionally created, which means we have to have a conversation. We have to explain it. We have to say, this is what it means to be in a dual agency situation. We're not going to look at our sellers or buyers and say, we're going to do dual sign here. We got to intentionally create it with informed written consent. Let's talk about what we mean by using an analogy. Do I have any football fans? Some of you. If you're not a fan, have you at least seen a football game? If you've seen a football game, you're enough to, 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 to stick with me, like a minute of football. Okay. When you're watching a football game and you're looking at the field, 
you see two teams on the field, right? And it's very clear that there are two teams playing. When you're watching the football game, you have a team in their home whites and you have another team in their away grays. It's really clear when you look at the field that you got two teams. So in our analogy, let's call the two teams the buyer and the seller. Buyer and the seller are on the field playing this game together, hoping to get to the end of the game. Prior to dual agency, before dual agency happens, the broker in the firm is acting as the coach. One firm is standing off to the side, shouting advice to the seller. Another firm is off to the side, shouting advice to the buyer, right? What happens in dual agency is we can't be a coach because one, we're the same firm. We're not two different firms. But we can't be the same firm because I have duties. I have equal loyalties to both. In a sense, in dual agency, I'm being expected to serve two kings. And how do you shout advice to one king that's going to make the other king happy? How can you help one king win the game when the other one isn't? So once we get into a dual agency situation, the, the team's roles don't change. The buyer's still buying and the seller's still selling. When we get into a dual agency situation, my role changes. And I go from being the coach to the referee. Is the referee still an important part of the game? Is the referee there to make sure everybody follows the rules and does what they're supposed to do? Sure. Is the referee telling the quarterback what play to make next? Is the referee telling the players what to do, how to win, how to get through the game? No, they're just there to make sure everybody plays the game right. So in dual agency, when we get into this dual agency situation, what I have to give up as the firm, what we have to stop, is I can no longer offer advocacy. I can't be over there shouting advice. There is no advice that I can offer one party that won't harm the other. So my role as an advocate takes a few steps back and I cannot offer either advice. Let's say your firm's in a dual agency situation and your buyer client wants to make an offer. And that buyer client looks at you and says, how much should I offer? If I tell them to offer less than asking price, I've harmed my seller client. If I tell them to offer asking price or more, I've harmed my buyer client. There's no way I can give advocacy to one team over the other. If we were to look at our picture, this is our dual agency wall. I got the buyer on one side, I got the seller on the other, and then straddling the wall equally and down the center is the firm and all the agents in the firm. I'm 50-50. I have a duty to represent both. And this is what the clients need to understand. When they hired me, they probably thought they were going to have full representation. They probably thought that it was going to be what's known as an exclusive relationship. We'll talk about that. But now I'm telling you, I'll help you get through the transaction. I'll do what I need to do, but I can't offer you advice. Guys, let me just go ahead and put this out there right now. Dual agency is not what's best for the clients. Can we see that much right now? Dual agency is not what's best for the clients. Uh, you guys, the first day of class, you all sent me your introductions with your selfies and your textbooks. And a lot of you tell me, and I love it. A lot of you tell me you're taking this class because you wanna help people achieve the American dream. You wanna help people buy and sell homes. You wanna help. You wanna be an advocate. And now I'm standing over here babbling on about how there may be a situation that you can't be an advocate because you're serving two kings. You're serving both sides. 
So let's break this down. Let's talk through a few scenarios. Let's say you are the listing agent and you're at the listing appointment. Dual agency is discussed in our listing agreement, whether or not we're going to do it, uh, whether or not we can get that informed written consent. And you explain dual agency to your seller and you ask your seller if they agree to dual, do dual agency. And the seller says, you mean if I do dual, you're not gonna be my advocate? If I do dual, you're not gonna be my coach? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And the seller says, no, I'm not doing that. Do they have the right to say no to dual? Of course they do. Intentionally created with informed written consent. If the seller says no to dual, this is what they need to understand. If the seller says no to dual, then no agent from the firm can bring their buyer client. If they say no to dual, no agent affiliated with that firm can bring their buyer client. We can bring our buyer customer and another firm, a different firm, can bring their client. When they say no, they're limiting their pool of buyers. If they say yes, they're agreeing to do away with their advocacy. I got a possible solution for dual agency. This does get a little bit better. So again, just please bear with me. Let's flip this coin. Let's say you're already working with a buyer client. A buyer has hired you to help them find a home. And you've been out with them for a couple months now showing them properties. And you've been out looking and they're not just finding the one and they just can't be happy and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden tomorrow, there's this new listing that hits the market. And that new listing is listed by your firm. And your buyer client says, ooh, I like that. Can we go see it? Before we take that buyer client to see the property, first off, we have to know that the seller has already agreed to do dual, but we have to have a conversation with the buyer about whether or not they're okay with doing dual. And if they say, no, I'm not doing dual, I can't show them any listings of my firm. If we're gonna say yes to dual, it's one firm, one transaction, two clients. If they say no, the seller's limiting their pool of buyers. The buyer is limiting the listings that they can see. Now, please keep in mind, we can always change our mind later. So, later. so let's go back to the seller. So you go through this and the seller says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay. Let's say you've been on the market for six months and you haven't had much activity. You haven't had much interest. And then all of a sudden you get a buyer represented by somebody in your firm interested. Can we go back and revisit this with the seller and see if they're willing to change their mind? Might they be more apt to change their mind if they've been on the market for six months? Sure. So we can always change our mind. Uh, we'd have to edit our agency agreement because we've already said no in writing. So we'd have to edit that agency agreement. I just don't want you guys to think that the no is the end all be all. We can always change our mind if the situation arises. <clears throat> the firm is gonna represent both the buyer and the seller with equal loyalty and the same transaction. And the only way that we can do this is with written permission of all parties. They've got to understand what they're getting themselves into. They've got to understand that if they agree to do this, they're giving up their advocacy. And again, I have a potential solution, but right now we're just talking about, so we have to have written permission from all parties and I have to act without compromising either principle. And how I do that is by not offering advocacy. Again, in dual agency, the firm's role changes. We go from being uh, the coach to the referee. And we got to have both parties permission, both parties consent. Like I said, 
dual agency is not what's in the best interest of the client. And that's why they need to understand what they're getting themselves into. There are some real estate firms that are large. There's uh, Keller Williams in Kernersville. They're probably up to like two, 300 agents. I mean, they're huge. If either party says no, they need to understand they're saying no to all of their agents. If the seller says no, that's 300 agents that aren't allowed to bring their buyer client. That's huge. What if we're just a two man show and they say no? Well, now you're just limiting, you, you, you guys with me? I need you to understand though, dual agency is literally a phone call away. You could be a one man show, have one listing with one sign and one yard and get one phone call from a buyer that says, I'm interested in buying 123 Main Street and I wanna be represented. Poof, just like that, you're in the potential for dual agency. The other thing I want us to understand is that dual agency follows the firm. You may have firms with multiple locations. You may have a firm with a location in Winston, Greensboro, and High Point. We're all affiliated with the same firm. It doesn't follow the office location. It follows the firm. So dual agency is, I'm gonna go back for one second. It'd be cool if I had a bouncing ball. Let's make sure we all see this. Dual agency is intentionally created with informed written consent. Get used to me saying that. Dual agency is intentionally created, which means it doesn't just happen. It has to be created on purpose. And how is it created? because we get informed written consent by both parties, seller and buyer. This is a horrible time to take a break, but it is what it is. And I don't want our little brains to go any further. So hold all those thoughts, hold all those questions. I got more to talk about dual when we come back, but let's take 10 and we'll keep going.
Did we come back for more? Bear with me. Are you guys gonna spend some time with agency this weekend? I wish I saw more head shaking, yes. Let's try that again. Are we gonna spend some time with agency this weekend? There we go. All right. Remember what I said, y'all aren't leaving this call tonight as an agency expert. You got to keep visiting. You got to keep going through it. So we'll talk about that when we leave. We'll talk about, <laughs> right? We'll talk about uh, what next week looks like, what you guys can do to review and get ready for next week. So I am taking attendance right now. Cheese, please. I feel you. I can't sit down, especially during these night classes. <laughs> Y'all would have me nodding off too. All right, so let's real quick. Dual agency is an in-house transaction. In-house transaction means how many firms? Show me, how many firms in-house? It is one firm. One firm is representing the seller in the transaction, the same firm is representing the buyer in the same transaction. Dual agency is intentionally created with informed written consent. And again, the challenge, the obvious challenge here is that we have to find a duty to represent both equally in the same transaction. <clears throat> we mentioned something yesterday when we were talking about our additional duties. And one of our additional duties was to avoid a conflict of interest. And one example of a conflict of interest that we gave was undisclosed dual agency. Undisclosed dual agency is not allowed. Why? Because in order to act as a dual agent, we have to have informed written consent. I can't just start acting like a dual agent without having both parties informed written consent. And if either party says no, then we can't proceed in this transaction. We cannot proceed. Um, again, maybe I can refer the buyer to a firm down, a different firm down the road, let them represent the buyer, collect a referral fee. We've got to have that to practice undisclosed dual agency. Y'all don't forget to rule A.0104. Rule A.0104 talks about dual agency. That's the commission rule we got. It's in the Campbell folder in the online learning system. Another thing I have in the online learning system for you guys is license law. 93A6. And license law 93A6 is disciplinary actions by the commission. If you want to know what could get yourself in trouble from the Real Estate Commission, read license law 93A-6, which is in the Campbell folder and the online learning system. And one thing you'll see in section A4 is talking about undisclosed dual agency. So dual agency is purposely created. It is done so with informed written consent. And even though we're representing both parties, even though I'm working both parties through the transaction, that still does not give me permission that still doesn't give me the right to share confidential information about one party to the other. I can't look at my seller and say, this is what I know about the buyer. And then look at my buyer and say, this is what I know about the seller. We still owe them both that duty of confidentiality. Old car doesn't go away. What goes away is advocacy. If either one of these clients look at you and start asking you questions. And those questions start with like, like, should I do this? Or do you think I should do that? There's our little red flag. Again, you guys, there's no advice 
in this transaction that I can offer one party that won't harm the other. So if we look at our official pictures, we drew it out for you, but if we look at our official pictures, you got Julie's real estate shop that's straddling the line. All of us are straddling the line. Buyers on one side, sellers on the other, they're kind of on their own now, aren't they? Because we're in dual. In this scenario, dual agency, there's two agents within Julie's real estate shop, one working with the buyer, one working with the seller. Dual agency can also be one agent of Julie's real estate shop working with both. Dual agency is one firm, one transaction, two clients. It can be one or two brokers. Go back with me real quick in your book to page 153. that little chart that we talked about at the top of 153. You guys see that word exclusive? We use exclusive to talk about some of these agency relationships. When you guys are studying this weekend, when you're studying agency, I really need you to pay attention to that word exclusive because that word exclusive means a whole lot. So first off, let me ask you guys something. If you are dating somebody exclusively, how many people should you be dating? How many people should, why do the women always answer that faster than the men? How many people should you be dating? If you're dating somebody exclusively, it should just be one. And when we're talking about agency relationships, if we have exclusivity, exclusivity is a one-way street, which means the seller can only date one firm. The firm is free to date as many sellers as they want to. If the buyer's an exclusive relationship, the buyer can only date one firm. The firm can date as many sellers as we want to. Makes sense so far, right? Remember that agent or that firm, that office in Kernersville that has like 300 agents? Could you imagine if only one of you could have a listing and only one of you could have a buyer at the same time? None of us would ever make any money, would we? So it's not uncommon for firms to have multiple listings, multiple buyers. When we get into dual agency, the exclusivity goes away. We're no longer only representing one party in that transaction. We're now serving both the exclusivity goes away. And that is what the buyer and the seller need to agree to. They need to agree to be treated the same in the same transaction. Once again, I have a possible solution for dual agency. But before we talk about that, let me get your questions on dual. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, say it's a situation where um, a seller wants to sell their prop, they're moving out of state or what have you, and they're going to sell their property to their niece. Okay. They've come, they've already agreed on a price and they both come in and they say, hey, this is what we want to do. Um, so you're not really doing anything. You're not uh, listing it, you're not doing anything. At that point, would they enter into a dual agency? Maybe. But remember this, April. I think it was either last night or Tuesday, I don't know. But the beginning of Unit 7, we talked about something called a transactional broker. And a transactional broker, nobody's represented. So if that seller comes to you and they say, my niece wants to buy my property, we already have all the details hashed out. Neither one of us want to hire you. We. we just want to use you, April, for your forms. You okay. can't be involved in that transaction. So in order for you to be involved, at least one of them has to hire you. Okay. And if both of them hire you, 
now you're a dual agent. Okay. Good question. Thank you. But what question? If if they both hire you now, you become a referee. You cannot provide them any guidance, correct? I can't <laughs> offer advice. Right. I'm still with, they're still in my plane, right? And I still have the job of getting everybody safely to point B, right? But now in dual agency, I have two first class passengers, right? In dual agency, there's nobody in coach. In dual agency, they're all up in first class. That's kind of a tricky because you got to, you know, seller and niece and family. I mean, you right. be careful about doing business with family. So yeah. it might be that, <laughs> right? I mean, some of you laugh because you know, it might be that it might be in their best interest to you know, just one of them to hire you, you know what I'm saying, to not, I mean, it's kind of a situational thing, but right. what I need us to understand is if nobody hires you, I can't be, if nobody hires a firm, I can't be involved. If both of them hire you, we're a dual agent. Got it. Hmm. Okay. But it's pre pretty much up to the buyer and the seller. They're the boss. Yeah. They're the one doing the hiring, right? Okay. So if they say, no, nah, we got this. Only one of us are going to hire you. Be like, are you sure? And are you going to document that conversation? Absolutely. You better believe it. Because yeah. <laughs> if it goes down, I need you to prove that you explained to them. I need you to prove that you had that conversation. Does that make sense? Yes. Instead of trying to call the commission and say, but I told them that's not going to get you anywhere. Right. Okay. What else on dual? Yeah, of course. What else on dual? Uh, does April allow them to use the form? As long as April's involved, then we can use the forms. As long as April, right? As long as she's involved and if they, one of them has hired her, then yeah, we can use April's for forms. But the forms that we have available to us are only available to realtors. So if you're not a realtor, if you don't want April involved, then you're calling an attorney to draft the forms up. It's the right, the forms aren't available to them. They're only available to realtors. Yeah, that's, a, I wanted to piggyback off on that because I may be getting off scope because I, I'm looking at something in a whole different state. So there may be, I don't know if it's the same in, in North Carolina. Can but I just say that makes me nervous? Because I need I to know, stick to I North know, Carolina I right now. I, I need, I, and, we're, and I'm happy to talk about that with you after class. But okay. I don't want to cause confusion. So Got can it. we just stick with North Carolina? Because Absolutely. It's and, then, right. and then I wanted to know if it was the same in North Carolina, but I'll, I'll reach out to you afterwards. Please. And, and, and okay. I, don't, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I just, I got you know, 20 some other people that I'm trying to stay in North Carolina. So thank you. Mm -hmm. What else on dual? Okay. All right. Well, then I got a question for you guys. Y'all got your private chat set? I'd like to hear from everybody. Tell me in a private chat, A, B, C, or D.
Can I hear from everybody? We weighing in? Okay, so let's talk about Tara. Tara's a broker with XYZ Realty. She signs an exclusive right to sell listing agreement with the seller. Later, Tara finds a buyer for the same property and agrees to represent the buyer in a written buyer agency agreement. In this situation, what is Tara? So first off, let's stop and ask ourselves, and you can show me, how many firms are involved in this, in this scenario? How many firms? Just one, XYZ Realty, right? Happens to be the same broker with both firms. How many transactions are involved in this? Are we talking about here? Just one. Tara has a listing. She has a buyer client that's interested in her listing. How many clients are involved in this? Two. They've both hired us. The seller hired us with the listing agreement. The buyer hired us with the buyer agency agreement. So in this situation, that meets the definition of our dual agency. Tara is acting as a dual agent, one firm, one transaction, two clients. She's got to get permission to switch them from exclusivity to dual. They have to know that they're giving up that exclusive representation. That's what we have to get, that informed written consent. Both of our agency agreements start with exclusivity and give us the option, dual agency, the consent to dual agency is built into our agency agreements. And we will look at that in just a second. And as a matter of fact, I'm gonna encourage you guys to look over these agency agreements this weekend, because one, it'll help you better understand dual and two, it'll get you ready for next week when we talk about it. Guys, here, here's, the, here's the things, several things going on here. Um, before, well, back in my administrative days, one of the things that I used to do was new agent training. So I got you guys as soon as you got your license, as soon as you got out of real estate school and you were rip and ready to start your new career, I got you. And the number one concern I always heard from new agents was, how do I know what to say? When I'm talking to a seller, when I'm talking to a buyer, how do I know what to say? And my response to them was to be familiar with the forms that are provided to us. We're not gonna read to them. Nobody wants you to read to them. But if we're familiar with the forms, we can use the forms to help us put words in our mouth. So when we are explaining dual agency to the seller, we sound like we know what we're talking about. When we are explaining buyer agency to the buyer, we can have these conversations. Dual agency happens every single day. Dual agency is so common. Like I told you earlier, it's literally a phone call away. You get a listing, you put a sign in the yard. Why do you put a sign in the yard? Because don't you want somebody to call and ask about your listing? Aren't you trying to sell it for your seller? That's your duty. That's your responsibility. So when a buyer is sitting in front of the house and calls your number from the sign in the front yard, and they're interested in that home, and they want to be unrepresented, poof, we're in the possibility of dual agency. It can happen that fast. I think that's the more common scenario, the more, uh, the, the easier way we think. Please remember too, it could happen the other way. You could already have the buyer client and then three months later, your firm takes on a listing that your buyer client is interested in. So it's one of these things that we need to be on alert. And if either party says no to dual, then I can't offer, I can't show that listing to that buyer. I got to have both agree to do. I have a question. Yep. Um, in this situation that you have on the screen, mm -hmm. um, the buyer, after they've signed the written agreement, um, but they haven't yet agreed to the dual agency, when they were told that they have to agree to dual agency to be able to purchase this seller's house, 
could they at that point leave the agreement and go with a different firm? I so mean, that the, they firm, avoid the firm may release them. That's a great question, Christina. The firm may decide that that's what's in the best interest of the buyer. So let me release you. Let me refer you to a firm down the street. You know, I'm going to call the firm down the street and say, hey, I'm sending a buyer. They're pulling in your driveway in just a few minutes. I want a referral fee because buyers and sellers typically don't just fall in your lap, right? If you get business from somebody, you probably got to pay for it. You want a referral fee. But, you know, that might be what the firm chooses to do because that could be in the best interest for the buyer. Um, they could also say, nope, you said no. If you want to see this house, you got to change your mind. Remember, they can always change their mind. It's kind of up to the firm. I don't think for the most part, firms are that mean, right? Because we do want what's best for our clients. And I think, again, let's all agree right now. Dual agency is not what's best for the clients. And that's why they need to understand what they're getting themselves into. That's why they need to understand. Never look at a client and say, we're going to do dual sign here. What did you just tell them? Absolutely nothing. That's why we say it's intentionally created with what? Informed written consent. So what's our possible solution to dual agency? No more doom and gloom. I got a solution, possibly. My possible solution, again, give me just a few minutes and I'll open it up for questions, okay? My possible solution to dual agency is something called designated dual agency. Welcome back. Designated dual agency is a form of dual agency. So off the bat, what do we know about designated dual agency? How many firms? One. How many transactions? One. How many clients? Two. It's a form of dual agency. In order to practice dual agency, the company first off has to have a policy on how they're gonna handle designated dual agency. Please understand this now. Not all firms offer designated dual agency. There is no licensed law that says everybody has to offer designated dual agency. It's entirely up to the option of the firm if they're gonna offer this designated dual agency. If they do decide to offer designated dual agency, then they have to have a company policy about how they're gonna handle it. One of the differences between dual and designated, dual could be two agents, dual could be one. Designated is always two agents. Designated, is always two agents, one firm, one transaction, two clients, two agents. So remember our, one of our pictures, this is dual agency. You have the buyer on one side of the dual agency wall, the seller on the other. And in dual agency, the firm and all the agents in the firm are straddling the wall, given this equal loyalty, this equal fairness, this equal everything, no advocacy. If the firm allows designated agency, what's gonna happen is the broker in charge, the manager, the broker in charge is gonna kick one agent off the wall. They're gonna designate one agent to exclusively work with the buyer. And then the broker in charge is gonna kick a different agent off the wall and they're gonna designate a different agent to work exclusively with the seller. Did y'all hear the magic word? These two agents are now offering exclusive representation, one to the buyer, one to the seller. Because they've been kicked off the wall, 
these two agents might as well proceed as if they were with two different firms. Exclusivity comes back. Football analogy, you went from being the coach to the referee. Once you're designated, you, the individual agent, get to go back to being the coach. Now you're saying, offer less than asking price. Get a home inspection, right? Now you're giving advice again. Guys, please look though. Where is the firm and all the other agents in the firm? Aren't they still straddling the wall? Dual agency didn't go away. Dual agency is still here. The firm and everybody else still has the duties and liabilities, responsibilities to both. It's just that one agent can now exclusively represent the buyer and a different agent can now exclusively represent the seller. Does this sound a little bit better? If you were a buyer or seller, do we like this a little bit better? Absolutely, absolutely. There are a couple caveats to designate it. <clears throat> In order to be designated, you cannot be designated, whoops, sorry. You cannot be designated if you have received prior confidential information about the other side. Remember, part of that exclusivity is sharing everything you know about the other party. So if you are supposed to be designated to work with the buyer, the broker in charge will look at you and say, do you know anything about my seller that can harm them in this transaction? If you've been working with the seller before you can be designated, the broker in charge is going to look at you and say, do you know anything about my buyer that can harm them in this transaction? If you don't know anything confidential about either party, you can be designated. If you do, you can't. The BIC may have to find somebody else in the firm to be designated. The BIC may have, and they may pay your referral fee. Y'all don't worry about your commission. But they may have to find, because they can't designate you if you have prior confidential information about the other side. The second caveat to designate a dual agency, I'm just going to throw this out there and tell you guys, this is probably the biggest problem topic in the entire unit. Designated dual agency, the provisional broker, which is you guys as soon as you get your license. The provisional broker cannot be designated opposite of their broker in charge. Here's why. As a provisional broker, well, let me back up for a second. You go pass your state exam and get your license. Yeah. You are handed a license that's on inactive status. Congratulations, here's a license that you can't do anything with. Good job. As a provisional broker, to activate your license, you have to affiliate with a firm and you have to be under the direct supervision of a broker in charge. As a provisional broker, your BIC is in your back pocket. They're with you on listing appointments. They are counseling you through um, showings and listings. Guys, they're not going to hand you a license and let you run amok on the streets. They're still going to require supervision. They want you guys to like, you know, learn and get good training, right? So as a provisional broker, if you want an active license, you have to affiliate with a firm. You have to be supervised by a broker in charge. Because of the nature of that relationship, if the broker in charge is doing their job, shouldn't they know something about the provisional broker's client? Again, I just told you they were with you on the listing appointment. They're probably you know, counseling you through the transaction. If the BIC is doing their job, they know something about the other side. 
And because of that, the provisional broker and the broker in charge cannot be designated. Please hear me. They can be in dual together. They cannot be designated opposite of each other. Any other relationship is allowed to be designated. You can have a provisional broker designated against a provisional broker. You can have a provisional broker designated against a full broker. You can have a full broker designated against a full broker. You can have a full broker designated against their broker in charge. All of these other relationships are allowed as long as either party doesn't have prior confidential information about the other side. You can never be designated if you have prior confidential information about the other side. Does this make us feel a little bit better? Are the warm fuzzies about real estate back? Okay, again, keep in mind, not all firms offer designated. This is really important to you when you guys are interviewing firms. Remember, I want you to shop around because remember what I'm trying to tell you, all firms are different. And if this is something that's really important to you, I would ask, y'all offer designated dual agency? Because if you do not join a firm that offers this, then you can't offer this. And I think, I mean, they're all different, but generally speaking, the large firms you're in, smaller firms, you may wanna ask, just to be sure. Here's our picture. Julie's Real Estate Shop and all the agents in Julie's Real Estate Shop are still straddling the wall. We are all still in dual agency. One agent, the selling agent, has been kicked off the wall to work exclusively with the buyer. A different agent in the firm has been kicked off the wall to work exclusively with the seller again, as long as you don't have prior confidential information about the other side. Does everybody understand what I mean by that? The selling agent can't have information about the seller. The listing agent can't have confidential information about the buyer. That's what we mean, you can't have confidential information about the other side. One more thing to say. As a reminder, Commission Rule 58A.0104 is all about agency agreements and disclosures. We'll talk about disclosure next week. We still got more in Unit 7 to do. 58A.0104 is in the Campbell folder in the online learning system. Read it. Read it again. What the heck for good measure? Go back and read it again. Questions on designated. Uh, good question. Can I have designated and not dual? Great question. Thank you. In order to have designated, I first have to have consent to dual. Designated is a form of dual. So in order to offer designated, I got to get two yeses to dual. Once I get two yeses to dual. So let's go back to this listing appointment. You're talking with the seller. You're talking about dual agency. The seller goes, <laughs> I don't like this. I want to be exclusively represented. Great. If you agree to dual, and your firm allows it, we can get you in a designated. Now your seller can open up their pool of buyers to anybody, no, assuming that the buyer agrees to it as well, knowing that they'll be exclusively represented by you, the individual agent. 
So as a long way to answer your question, in order to have designated, we first have to have consent to dual. Dual comes first. If I get a yes to dual, <laughs> then we can get a yes to designated. Yeah. No question? Okay, so since we're always talking about money, so I'm there and I've got my guy and I said, okay, um, instead of me representing both and being the dual myself, I can, we can do an exclusive with my firm and you'll get the other two people involved. Does that mean I only get a, um, the money for finder's fee? That's going to be up to the firm's policy, but generally speaking, you would probably be entitled to collect a referral fee because you, you connect the two. Firm's policy has to allow it. Remember, all firms are different. So I'm not going to stand here and say yes, absolutely. Because sure enough, there's a firm out there that wouldn't do it, right? But I think generally speaking. Again, you guys, please do not get in your own way. What do I mean by that? When I went into sales, I made it a personal decision, personal decision, never to be the one agent in a dual agent situation. That just got too tricky for me. The muddies got the waters got too muddy. I didn't like it. And I chose just my decision. I chose to not act as one agent in a dual agent situation. Remember. Your test is not going to ask you what you're going to do, how you're going to conduct your business. Your test is going to ask you what you can do. So shake your head yes or no. Can you be the sole agent in a dual agency situation? Can you be the sole agent in dual? And that's what your test is going to ask you. Shake your head yes or no. Can you be the sole agent in a designated dual agency situation? You guys caught this because designated is always how many agents? Always two. Y'all want to hear a funny story? We were at an educators conference a couple of years ago. We were still live. So it's been at least three years. And uh, one of the speakers teaches CE quite frequently. And CE that year was covering, guess what? Agency particularly spending a good amount of time on dual agency and designated dual agency. Remember I said a lot of these topics tend to resurface in continuing education and your firm's trainings. And it's good reason they resurface, okay? So this instructor is teaching CE and he's teaching CE to broker in charges. He is teaching CE to broker in charges. And he said, how many of your firms practice designated dual agency? And, you know, a handful of hands went up and he called on one of the, the broker in charges. And he said, how many people are in your office? And that broker in charge said, oh, it's just me. Is that right? No, we always need two. We always need two to do designated. One or two to do dual, two to do designated. Um, point out just a few things. Of course, we're looking at our book anyway. The italicized on 159 and 160 is commission rule A.0104. My recommendation is that you guys look at what I have in the Campbell folder because I know what's in the Campbell folder is up to date. I can make no validity to the fact that it's in your book is up to date. So please, you guys promise me, anytime you see a form in your book, ignore it in your book always go to the online learning system, okay? Please turn with me to page 162. As you guys are studying agency this weekend, 162 has some scenarios about oral versus written consent for dual agency. 
I briefly mentioned that we may be able to work with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement at first. We won't get to that till next week. So we'll talk about oral buyer agency next week. But if we're working with a buyer under an oral buyer agency agreement, then I got to get consent to dual orally too. Again, we'll get to the specifics. But what I want you guys to do for me right now on page 162, I want you to cross out situation number two. On page 162, just do away with situation number two. And here's why. Situation number two gives the impression that I can change something in a written agreement orally. And that's not right. Basic contract law says, once I have it in writing, the only way I can change it is in writing. And this is where situation two can be misleading. Basic contract law says, if you say no to dual in writing and you later change your mind, the only way we can legally make that change is if I get you to change it in writing. Makes sense, doesn't it? So ignore situation number two. Also next week, we're gonna talk about agency disclosure. Um, we've been building agency, but we also have to talk about agency disclosure next week. This is my opportunity to, you know, disclose my agency status. So we'll talk about that. And then the last thing in unit seven is talking about um, your independent contractor relationship with your firm, independent contractor versus an employee. So we still got a little bit more to go in unit seven, but that's okay. I've given you guys enough to do this weekend. Yes, I got you reviewing all of unit seven. I got you looking ahead at unit eight. Did y'all think I was kidding when I told you unit seven and eight were deep? I hope you didn't think I was joshing you because you know what? <laughs> I think I'm proving myself right about now. So we all got head bobs that we're spending time in agency this weekend. I also want to show you guys something in learn test pass. Nope, online learning system, sorry. Online learning system. <clears throat> when you're looking at the online learning system, you guys see these tabs on the left-hand side and we got the various units. In unit eight, I have our exclusive right to sell listing agreement that we're gonna talk about next week. I also have our buyer agency agreement. So they're here, they're loaded, they're ready for us to talk about next week. One thing I would like you guys to consider doing this weekend is to look at either one of these agency agreements. And if you look at either one of these agency agreements, and I'm just gonna look at this one because this is the one that's here. If I scroll down to page four, this is dual agency as it is explained to the buyer. Remember when I said use the, the forms to help put words in your mouth? Y'all don't need to go out there and recreate the wheel. The wheel has already been created. So I would like you guys to read, and you can read both, but if you only wanna do one, dual agency as it's explained to the buyer, versus dual agency as it's explained to the seller. And if we scroll down, here's designated dual agency. Let's look at this. Let's make sure we can see this. Um, we have, to, your client, your buyer in this case has choices. If they agree to dual agency, the buyer authorizes the firm to act as a dual agency representing both the buyer or the seller, or the buyer wants exclusive representation and does not authorize dual agency. They got a choice to make, don't they? They either allow dual agency or they continue on with their exclusive representation. And that's what we mean. These start as exclusive agency agreements. 
But if they agree to do dual, if they initial here, then they are agreeing to lose that exclusivity. They're ex agreeing for the firm to represent both. So we have the form to help us have a conversation. And then we look at our buyer and seller and say, you have a choice. You got to say yes or no to dual agency. And I think it's really going to help you guys to, of course, we're looking at the book. We're going back and reviewing the YouTube channel. We're doing all that. But we're also looking at dual agency as it's explained, how we're having these conversations to the buyers and the sellers. What questions do I have? When we come back together on Tuesday, we're gonna pick up on page 163. Kind of near the bottom of 163, we have some bullets there and some important points about dual and designated agency. I think that's a, that's a great place to start us on Tuesday because we'll come in with a good review, kind of do the summary uh, and sum that up. So you guys, today's your lucky day. You guys get out a few minutes early. My goal tonight was to get you guys to where my night class is. Y'all want to know where my night class, or you are my night class, my day class, all this week, all I've done is talk about agency. My goal tonight was to get you guys to where my day class ended, and we are exactly here. So all of you guys are studying the same thing this week, and I got all y'all out reading there, the, the agency agreement, um, all getting ready for the same thing next week. It's less for me to remember. No, I'm just kidding. But we're all at a good stopping place. Somebody just asked for the YouTube channel again in the chat. So there we go. Click it, copy and paste, subscribe, however you can find it. The other thing I have to say to you guys is remember I'm a resource. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I just don't work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 5.30 to 8.30, right? Like, like, I mean, I wish that's all I had to do is teach for nine hours a week and not have to worry about anything. But I'm around all week. I'm around all weekend. Never hesitate to reach out to me. Let me know how I can help you. Are we good? You guys going to come back next week? Okay. Y'all have a great weekend. Have fun with agency <laughs> and we will see you guys Tuesday night. Hey, Julie. Yeah. May I ask you a question about sub agency? Of course. I'm trying